Hello everybody and welcome to another top 10 edition of Magic Mike's. Probably sponsored by our Patreon supporters and CoolStuffInc.com where you can find cool stuff in stock every day. And our co-sponsor CardHoarder.com offering the best inventory prices and delivery of cards for Magic Online. I am Evan Irwin we get started each top 10 by saying hello to my two co-hosts, Ruben Bressler. Oh hi, how are you this evening? And Aaron Campbell. Hey! Hi now, we also began right. <laughs> with our choice. It was very musical. It was. It was a note. I, I feel very musical. We're, what, 20, 21 days away from Christmas? It's, Is oh. it beginning to look a lot like it? It's beginning to look a lot like Dredgmas. Oh, my God. Woo! So, we also began with our choice of the top comment from last week in a segment we call Honorable Mention, where Ruben will tell us who was the most prolific in letting us know what card we didn't choose as one of our top ten Ixalan cards. Ruben? Sorry, I blacked out for a minute there after the music started. But, I do have a winner this week. Uh, this week's winner is Cat C, who writes, maybe this was just me. But when this card showed up in the spoiler, I was more excited than I was for any new Planeswalker or Mythic. So rarely does Watsy give us a card that is just a pure, fresh, perfect meme. I am, of course, talking about Shorekeeper. Everything about this card is hilariously great. It's Magic's first trilobite, generating endless trilobite tribal jokes, charts, and deck lists. Everyone has made the one-mana draw three joke. It has an ability and flavor text that immediately prompted comparisons to Treasure Cruise. It gave everyone hilarious, look how bad card draw has gotten material. From top to bottom, this card seemed built as a wink to the community, and it will definitely be the card that gives me the most warm feels in a few years when I look back on Ixalan. Aww. Well, well that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, just a really nice... That was a nice uh, package of, of why Shorekeeper... I had forgotten in the immediate build-up to Ixalan that everyone was all over Trial by Tribal and, uh, and, and that sort of joke, so that was a nice little reminder. It's pretty yeah. sweet. Um, yeah. So please, Cat C, contact us on any of our social channels, and we will get you your fifty dollars gift certificate to CoolStuffInc.com. And for those listening, we're going to list off our top ten Rakdos cards, and then you're going to tell us what your favorite is that we didn't talk about, and we'll pick it. You know, hopefully, though, Ruben will choose you for right. the honorable mention. This week, uh, at the end of last week's show, our live show, uh, MTG underscore Dragon snuck in and was like, "Do Rakdos this week, please," and I was like, "I got you, bro." So. <laughs> MTG Dragon, this one's this one's for you. We we listen to the people. That's that's what we do. So that's awesome. Now uh, there's plenty of uh, there's plenty of sort of people running into each other. Uh, Aaron, yeah. I think your first couple of choices are unavailable. My number ten and my number nine are both higher, but that is it. I'm on the board from eight through one. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and get started here with number ten. Ruben, what's your number ten? So uh, I ran a poll yesterday asking whether or not this card qualified as a Rakdos card. <laughs> and 62% of those responding of the 162 final votes said that it does. So this is my number 10. It is the hit half of hit run. So the card hit is a colorless, a black, and a red. It's an uncommon from dissension. Target player sacrifices an artifact or a creature Hit deals damage to that player equal to that permanent's converted mana cost. This is this is just a personal card for me. I, I don't know why, but at this time when I was in college, I was really obsessed with the Mardu color combination. Um, I had a, a, a white, red, black aggro deck that you know took advantage of Isamaru and things like Rakdos Guild Mage, uh, Dark Confidant, lots of stuff like that. And Hit was the the card I wanted to draw the most. I can count on, I can't, I, it's more than on my hands and toes the number of times I flipped a hit run to a Dark Confidant and taken eight and still won that game. Just because this card is so good, especially in that standard environment when oh, everyone, yeah. was, everyone was playing giant, you know, bounce lands and, and you know, Fire Main Angel was the smallest thing that I would hit with hit. Um, it was just a delightful card to play. I loved it. And truth be told, it does have the Rakdos watermark right in the middle of the rules text. So... That's my number ten Rakdos card. Pretty, pretty flavorful stuff all around. Fair enough. So sixty yeah, percent. I, That's I just to... love this card. I, and this one, this one, usually I pick stuff that has tournament pedigree or wins a lot. This one is just a personal one. I that just like casting hit. That one's just for you. Yeah. <laughs> so my number ten is uh, it's a hybrid card. 
uh, that they printed in Shadowmoor, they finally brought it back in Commander 2016. Uh, there's a few very sort of Rakdos things that, that happen to different Rakdos type cards. And Everlasting Torment from Shadowmoor is very Rakdosy to me. It's a it's a hybrid mana and two generic mana. So Rakdos and two. Uh, for a rare enchantment, players can't gain life. Damage can't be prevented. And all damage is dealt as though its source had wither. A source with wither deals damage to creatures in the form of minus one, minus one counters. So this to me, it, it shuts off any way for you to kind of get better. It shuts off any way right. for you to really save any of your creatures because even protection from whatever was not going to was not going to stop it. Right. When the torment happens, the torment is just going to stay, and you're going to hurt, and that's going to be sweet, because that's what Rakdos does. Yeah. <clears throat> this reminds me of a card that they did in Return of Ravnica Block. I think it was called Havoc Festival. Mm -hmm. uh, that was similar. I think it was four and a black and a red. Uh, players can't gain life, and then at uh, the start of every turn, I think they lose their life. Both players lose their life, half their life rounded down. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what this reminds me of. But yeah, this was yeah. the original. Yeah, it was the, it was yeah, the OG. Yeah, yeah, certainly the the sentence players can't gain life. Boy, you're gonna have a hard time uh, not not getting me on board with that card. <laughs> um, but yeah, this was this was uh, saw a little bit of play in standard, primarily against Kitchen Finks decks. This thing does everything against Kitchen Finks, obviously. Yeah. Um, it saw a little bit of play. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, the red decks and the black decks couldn't really keep up in the in the meta game of the uh, you know infinite mirror entity body double combo and also uh, you know the the fairies menace. Oh. Um, but but Everlasting Torment is a, is a fabulous card and super, super Rakdos. Now, I don't have a number nine because it's higher. Aaron doesn't have a number nine because it's higher. Ruben? Make it three for three. Oh! oh. I don't have a number nine. Uh, oh, by the way, Aaron only has two hires on her list. That's amateur hour. Right? <laughs> those, are, those are amateur numbers. Time to get those numbers up. I have five hires on my Get list. on his level. Wow. <laughs> I've got four. And yeah. uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> my number eight is also higher on someone else's list. So, uh, Ruben, do you have a number eight? I do. This is one of the... Boy, we found a, a, an island in the storm here. Because I actually have a number eight. Um, very rarely is there a confluence of a card confluence. that... Well, not a mana confluence, but a confluence <laughs> of a card where not only does it have tournament pedigree, not only is it super flavorful, not only is it super popular and really identifies with the color combination, but it has a moment associated with it in magic history. Um, and Rakdos's return being cast by the French national team in the top eight of the World Magic Cup uh, a, either last year or two years ago um, to, to solidify their place in magic history uh, certainly qualifies. So Rakdos Return um, is a X, a red, and a black sorcery from Return to Ravnica. Mm -hmm. um, deal X damage to target player. That player discards X cards. Well, technically, you target opponent. Target opponent, sorry. Can't you target yourself. opponent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can't do it to yourself. That's uh, unfortunate, I guess. He can't return um, himself. Right. So you get your you get your fireball, a little bit of your fireball. You get your mind twist, a little bit of your mind twist. That, but the fireball is not fireball, and the mind twist isn't mind twist. But you know what? You smush them together, and it's it's something else because this saw, card saw a lot of play in a lot of different decks um, over the course of its lifespan. And Rakdos Return is just a super super powerful card. So this was my number 10. Oh, good. Uh, and this was a card that I used. Uh, I played Standard Jund uh, during Return to Ravnica in a Strad block. And so uh, this card was fantastic, especially in the mirror, because those games tended to be very grindy. Um, and so it also made for a fantastic mana sink. You know, it was great in the early games for when you wanted to be precise. Like, say your opponent had exactly three cards and you all you could afford was enough to get rid of the three cards. Um, it also made a fantastic top deck. You know, this was also a deck that ran Bonfire the Damned. And so, you Know, there were a lot of really great things you could draw that could just sort of end the game, you know, Miracle Bonfire. Um, again, Rakdos is a turn. Great in the early, when you're sitting around with nothing to do on turn 9 or 10, you have all the mana in the world. Who cares if they have no cards in hand? You're still able to just burn the hell out of them. And uh, this card did exactly what Jun needed to do at the time, and I, I cast many of these, which is a little unlike me, um, but I had a lot of fun doing it. And I have to say, the one thing I always remember about this card is the grammar of it. Like, when I look at that apostrophe and the extra S... 
I kind of twitch a little bit. Like I'm, I'm sure that that's how it's supposed to be, but I'm so used to things that end in S just having the apostrophe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So having the rectosis. Yeah. That was like, a, a bit of a can. copywriting selection. <laughs> yeah. It, I, just, it just makes me twitch a little bit. I literally mm-hmm. searched for it that way without the S on the end. Yeah. Because yeah. That's, that's what I thought. That, and that's typically that how I, how I, when I'm writing, that's how I write. But yeah, uh, it's but yeah hard. absolutely. Hard to get more uh, rakdosy than it actually is called rakdoses something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty pretty rakdosy. Um, and and a terrific card in and of itself. Two great tastes, if you will. Right. And yeah. had they had they had the planeswalker stamp for story cards, I think that rakdos return would have had that planeswalker stamp. Sure. So it has everything going for it. Yeah, and it looks great. So move on here to number nine. No, I'm sorry for number eight. Uh, for Aaron, Aaron, what you got? My number eight is a very potent sideboard card. I also think it's very underrated. I don't see as many people using it as I think they should um, because it really does everything, specifically in modern. I feel like it answers uh, a lot of what people are trying to do right now. And my favorite usage of this card was when people used to bring it in against Splinter Twin, uh, specifically for the last mode um, because it made a really nice surprise uh, when someone's trying to hit you with a million pester meats uh, and you respond with my number eight, which is Rakdos Charm. Yeah. Uh, so Rakdos Charm is a red and a black. It's an instant. It's a modal card. So you can choose one. You can either exile all cards from target player's graveyard, or you can destroy target artifact, or you can have each creature deal one damage to its controller. So you'd have the Splinter Twin player go off, and you would ask them, how many are you making? And most people would be like, well, why does it matter? And you're like, oh, it matters. <laughs> and then they would say something ridiculous like 105. And you'd be like, great. And you'd tap a black and a red. And you'd be like, take 105. And so a <laughs> um, very underrated answer to that card. But again, you can you can exile graveyards with this. This is something I've had used against me with the decks that I play in modern. Destroying an artifact can be really good. You know, black really struggles with dealing with artifacts sometimes. Um, and it's just a very versatile card. I have it in... All of my EDH decks that can support these colors, I think it's really good. And I love this. I think it's one of the most underrated charms. And uh, I think it has uh, more of a home than people give it credit for. Now, to be clear here, Aaron, you like this card. <laughs> I do, yeah. I like options. I like having you're, options. You're, you're not on brand, okay? That's what that's what they call <laughs> no, that, all right? Just, you're going to be just, on I mean, brand. No, it's fine. You're allowed to have one. Like, if you're playing modern dredge and dredge becomes the most popular deck you're saying this is the sideboard card that you would allow (laughs) yourself to play i mean i I have been known to put in a ravenous trap or two or things of that nature but yeah i've used arachnos charm in my days this this is not great hashtag for the brand i'm not i'm not sure i'm I'm on solid ground anymore well just because i want to do dumb things in my graveyard doesn't mean i want you to be able to do them I mean, that's fair that's, yeah, exactly. that's, a, that's a fair point uh recto's charm <laughs> in and of itself it was it's it was funny to me how how incredibly powerful all those charms ended up being even i yeah. didn't think this card like i was like all right this card's okay but like oh wait right. while they're screaming infinity fairies you just kill them and yeah. i'm like oh okay and the uh, golgari charm you know minus one minus one destroying right. enchantments all that stuff was just you know not incredibly powerful effects in and of themselves but they the sum the other, is greater than the parts. And the other thing that was really that Rakdos Charm really had going for it is that um, first of all, the mana was super easy in the standard format. But um, you all uh, sideboard slots were at premium. There were so many decks that did so many different things mm-hmm. during that standard format uh, that you that having the ability to deal with artifacts and being able to deal with graveyards in one card really helped consolidate sideboards. Yeah, yeah. they played a lot of Sphinx's Revelation, and then they then they won a lot. That's what well, that my too. opponents did a lot. That card is uh, yeah. card's bad. Not bad. Bad isn't good. You know what I mean. Yeah. Rack those charms, though. Bad. Terrific. Uh, all right, here. So let's move on. I don't have a number eight. That makes me sad. But we, <laughs> but I but do. Soldier on. I do have a number seven, and but I won't have a number six. It's fine. Whatever. Um, sure, Shadow. Yeah. Just give you some four. Uh, so. My number seven is uh, is a very infamous card because it really had to do with timing. And it's not often that magic, particularly tournament magic, starts to get down to the neediest of the grittiest. It's very Esper Charmish in a way. You know, it's like, who are you targeting? Because only one mode, whatever. This one was very much about, has the trigger resolved? Because mm-hmm. Demigod of Revenge 
is oh. a hell of a card. It's five hybrid mana, five Rakdos hybrid mana, five black, five red, or any other combination thereof for a rare spirit avatar that is a 5-4 flying haster. When you cast it, return all cards named Demigod of Revenge from your graveyard to the battlefield. And let me tell you, what would happen is that someone would play it, and then, then someone would counter that copy of Demigod of Revenge. And then they would say, you know, does my counterspell resolve? And they go, yeah, you know, sure, whatever. And then because the trigger goes on the stack above the counterspell, right. then the trigger's gone, and then the and spell's countered. And it doesn't countered. target, and that's the important part. Right, and it does yeah. not target. So that led to a lot of very problematic interactions, is a way to yeah. put it. You know, a lot of pissed off people, really, going just like, you think I would let that resolve if I missed right. my trigger? And then you're like, well, here's how the rules work. And it was yeah. very much a card that taught people the intricacy of how the stack works, right. which Wizards rarely does, honestly. So you're saying that, so I'm not even clear. So you're saying that there's a way, so I were to cast Demigod, and yes. Ruben were to try to counter it because he would just, naturally not let me have it mm -hmm. and so there's a way to stack it where i can get that trigger or is it right. just if it's being so, countered essentially if you go demi god of revenge on the stack and i go counter spell and you say okay counter spell oh, well first of all demi god of revenge on the stack demi god trigger on the stack right counter spell the spell spell's gone okay. trigger remains on the stack and now it's in the graveyard so it would, it would bring itself back into play much like okay. revenge Okay, so it's almost like stacking bridge triggers. It's like, you know, you can block and you're going to lose your Icarid, but if you yeah. stack it in such a way, you'll still get your zombies. Okay. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it was a little weird. And I definitely got got by this. Um, mm. I, I, I was playing in a tournament. I think this was in Nash, in uh, Memphis at Nationals uh, against Mr. David Irvine, um, notable Magic player from back in the day. I remember. Uh, and, and I countered a Demigod of Revenge and... He just was like, all right, trigger resolves. And then I called over a judge, and then the judge was like, yeah, that's how that works. And I was like, oh, all right, yeah. great. And then, so that that happened. Um, I was exhausted at the end of that weekend, so even if I knew how the trick worked, it wasn't going to affect anything. But that was my first iteration with Demigod or Revenge. Has a little bit of tournament pedigree. Uh, oh, the, yeah. famous, the famous Elves Extended Pro Tour. Uh, there was a top 16 finish in, of All In Red. I will give you a dollar if you can name who finished in the top 16 with all in red at Pro Tour Berlin. Do you know? Do I get a hint? Uh, he does Magic the Gathering coverage. Patrick Sullivan? Oh. Patrick Chapin. This was Rashad Miller. Whoa! Whoa. Finished in the top 16 of Pro Tour Berlin wow. with all in red. Wow. Mm. That's pretty crazy. That's your magic trick for the day. So, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, I, I felt, I mean, this saw enough play to where that thing about the stack and the triggers and the resolving was a definite thing. And people were yeah. usually upset about it. So, moving on here. Uh, Aaron, what is your number seven? So my number seven is uh, part of a family of cards, uh, an umbrella, if you will, of cards, uh, an umbrella type effect of cards that we've seen a lot of through the years. Uh, we've seen the extirpates, we've seen the surgical extractions, we've seen the cranial extractions and things of that nature. Uh, but the one thing all of those cards have in common is that they can be countered and it's probably gonna feel bad when it happens, just like it feels bad when anything you cast gets countered. Uh, but in Return to Ravnica, they gave us a card that gets around that pesky little problem and they called it Slaughter Games. Um, so Slaughter Games is two, a black, and a red, and it says right on the top, it's a sorcery and it can't be countered by spells or abilities. Uh, you can name a non-land card, you then search the opponent's graveyard, hand, and library for any number of cards with that name and exile them, and then you get to shuffle your library. And so this is a really great card for stopping combo decks. Uh, me as an ad nauseum player in modern, if you ever name ad nauseum, I'm pretty much done. <laughs> um, and so I've been on the wrong end of this before. Bring to light scape shift oftentimes would make an exception for this card to yep. be able to stop opposing scape shift decks. Living End has been known to use this uh, because they tend to run uh, Simeon Spirit Guides. And so they're able to get this card out a little bit faster. Uh, and also because they're weak to other combo decks, you know, they're more of a creature combo deck and they don't really have many ways to interact with Storm and, and, and ad nauseum and things like that. Um, but this is a really great card. It's very flavorful. I love the art of sort of the people looking down mm -hmm. at the person. Um, you know, I don't really see many instances of this style before. Like the POV, yeah. Yeah, oh, so yeah. Good. So the, the art is really beautiful. I love all of the hue. 
hues. Um, it's pretty, you know, typically with Rakdos, we're used to sort of the gore, the sort of ironic gore, the, you know, the glee behind that, the sort of campy, campy violence. And this one is just more eerie, you know, it's, it's, mm. it's pretty, really. Um, and I just love this card. I've used it myself, and it's a, it's a very potent weapon. It's um it, to me like I, for me it, it's like really menacing it's really like scary because this this to me is that uh, what I would describe as uh, the trunk shot that um, that Quentin Tarantino likes to use so often where yeah. you open the trunk and like you're looking up at whoever is opening the trunk and they're like just they're down they're coming to get you so that's very scary cranial extraction type you know type effects uh, used to be super like rare they would hardly ever do them they were very special they were very yeah. expensive. Uh, and then and, a bunch came out all in a row. And then they just made like one every single set for, you know, every single yeah. block for like, you know, five years or something. Uh, so the effect itself wasn't that exciting, but can't be countered as a thing. It, I wish it had cost three mana. I think having to jump through the hoops of both types of mana. Okay. Safe. This would have been safe. All right. <laughs> Get out of here with that. You might have you been able to get away with black, black, red. Okay. And I'll take maybe. it. Yeah, but yeah. that then it becomes was... weird. Right. I always thought this was from the point of view of a cake. I don't know. Maybe that was just... <laughs> <laughs> that, that was just this guy's got the big butcher sleeve out and he's ready to cut the cake. If that's what you want to call the person below them, sure. Sure. When, you know what that reminds me of? That reminds me of that episode of Star Trek where, uh, did you ever yeah. see the episode of Next Generation where Data had the hallucinations uh -huh. and Troy was the cake yeah, yeah. and he had the oh, knife okay. and she's like, what are you doing? And then he tries Data to like had cut the her. Phone and had the old timey phone yes. in his chest. Oh yeah. my God. And the robot started having hallucinations. <laughs> that was a fun episode. <laughs> yeah. Robots be tripping, y'all. Robots yeah. be tripping. Oh man. So that, that was, that's definitely a fun one. Um, Ruben, watch number seven. I don't know if you can believe this, but my number seven's higher than someone else's. Oh my god! All right, it's fine. I don't even have a number six. Hey, Aaron, what's your number six? My number six is a card with a very unique effect, or it was unique at the time. Uh, Planeswalkers have been around for a while. Uh, they obviously could be dealt with. You know, you could certainly attack into them. You could certainly uh, choose to redirect damage to them, like with burn spells and things of that nature. But we hadn't really seen any spells that let you target them specifically. Um, and, and this was one of the first, uh, at least that I can recall. Uh, my number six is Dreadbor. Um, so Dreadbor is a black and a red, uh, which is the same mana cost as Terminate, which is another big... Uh, exciting Rakdos card is a sorcery and it specifically just says destroy target creature or planeswalker and you know we've obviously seen our share of destroy creature spells we've had our go for the throats we've had our whatever um we've certainly had our burn spells but this was the first that i can recall that was really like destroy target planeswalker mm -hmm. um and this was a huge deal i remember how exciting this was i love the art of sort of the Rakdos symbol burning into some poor dude um and this was you know after that we had hero's downfall and then we had the ruinous paths and uh, yeah. as far as i know this was the one that really set the trend for that and so that's why it's my number six it's, Absolutely. it's, a, it's a terrifically efficient spell you know i think uh terminate is amazing but if you slow it down just a little and you let me kill a planeswalker it's a big deal right i'm okay with that exchange yeah and the art is so cool the, the racto symbol through the yeah, guy absolutely. unbelievable previous to this spell black had no way to kill planeswalkers yep and then you get Heroes Downfall and Ruinous Path and all the things that say destroy target planeswalker. It's standard now, yeah. Yeah, right. but Wizards didn't want to print cards that said destroy a planeswalker on them originally. They printed planeswalkers, but didn't want they wanted the way to kill them to be damage. They didn't want there to be the way to kill them like you can kill creatures. And then they sort of gave in to the design space. Um, and it was all for the better. Uh, and Dreadbore uh, uh, being the first among them, as you mentioned. Um, a little bit restrictive, of course, having to stick to red and black, but fortunately at the time, mono black was the deck du jour, so you could very easily splash red, and many did. Uh, uh, I think Eric Froelich had a Grand Prix top eight with a red-black um, uh, devotion uh, kind of deck um, um, along the way, and uh, you know, right alongside lots of the other Return to Ravnica staples, Dreadboard definitely deserving of a slot. Well, this was also... I'm ahead. sorry. I was going to say this also had a home in the standard Jun decks. You know, Jun's mm -hmm. sort of 50-50, where it's kind of good against everything. And so, you know, you could, it also kind of ran a chair of Planeswalkers. And so, uh, yeah, this card had been in very nicely there of just sort of cheap, efficient answers that whatever you got, we can find a way to kill it. Yep. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to die to Dreadbore if you can target it. 
And that's yeah. a good thing. And, and the other thing why they didn't want to print uh, Destroyed Target Planeswalker super early was in the rules of Magic, when they started, that says you are a Planeswalker. Right. Um, and it took until Unstable, which is about to be released this Friday, for to someone destroy player. to destroy yeah. Target Player. That's a thing now, which, first of all, is awesome. But that was one of the things. It's like all the old rule books. The first thing they say is you are a Planeswalker. It's also a Rakdos card, Baron Von Doom. Uh, or Count Von Doom, right? Or Count Von Varen, or whatever. Um, but but uh, it's to, to be able to destroy target player, so fits in nicely with the Rakdos. Theme. You know what they're doing? They're staying on brand. Okay, that's that's that's, that's how we're brand rolling. Synergy, keeping it that there. You keep it, brand. <laughs> Ruben, what's your number six? It's it's funny because Rakdos mm-hmm. for the brand, and then you like you brand. All the way through. Okay. Lactose okay. brand. Wow. See, <laughs> the word has two meanings. All right. My number seven's higher on somebody else's list. Sure. Why not? You know, nothing means anything. Uh, your number six, rather. My number six. Yes, we are on um, number six. Sure. So I was, uh, uh, I sort of sent myself to do coverage of Pro Tour Montreal. Um, because I, I'd never been to a pro tour and I wanted to be a part of the pro tour as part of the, the coverage of, of Star City Games. This was before uh, uh, we went to Ireland and did some of the other kind of stuff. And I just wanted to go to I didn't, I'd never been to Montreal. Uh, I decided that February was a really good time to go. Um, and, uh, and I went up there and was you know taking photos and, and doing all this kind of stuff. And turns out, uh, that a bunch of the team members of uh, what became Team Star City Games, which eventually became Pantheon, uh, were playing this Aristocrats deck named, named after a couple of cards uh, from Return to Ravnica, one of them being Falkenrath Aristocrat, uh, which is my number six. My so Falkenrath Aristocrat, there you go. Falkenrath Aristocrat is two colorless, black and a red, rare. Um, it's a 4-1 flying haste. Uh, was recently reprinted in uh, Modern Masters, but originally, of course, was from Dark Ascension. It's a. An, it, additionally, it has the ability to sacrifice a creature, colon. Falconrath Aristocrat is indestructible this turn. If the sacrificed creature was a human, put a plus one, plus one counter on Falconrath Aristocrat. Um, and Tom Martell ended up winning that Pro Tour with Aristocrats, uh, which was a sort of Mardu sacrifice outlet kind of mix-up. Uh, that had lots of options and was quite aggressive and could battle on lots of different kinds of fronts and ended up taking down the tournament. And the deck was named after Cartel Aristocrat and Falkenroth Aristocrat, which uh, which were the sacrifice outlets du jour of the deck. And uh, and Falkenroth Aristocrat is a card that is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I've cast a lot of them in all sorts of different formats, including Cube. Uh, back when the Legacy Cube had the sacrifice theme, I was a big fan. Uh, Falkenroth Aristocrat is just a great card, and I love it. And can we talk about the art for a second? You know, you have this beautiful vampire uh, floating above the air with this gorgeous long white dress on. And as she's fed, you see the blood like creeping up and like coloring the dress. That is gorgeous. Wow. Uh, there is some art floating around. I don't know if it's official or not. Um, but right around the time Shadows of Her Innistrad came out, there was some art of her Eldrazi eyes or like eldrazi Yeah. Gorgeous. Like it's so creepy. Her, She's known for sort of having that big hair. Well, the hair is Eldrazi eyes, so it's like this huge. Oh my god! If you get a chance, go look up the Eldrazi uh, Falcon Rather Christie. I've seen beautiful. that. Oh they gosh. commissioned a bunch of art that were homages to uh, to previous uh, uh, Innistrad block arts. I don't think they ended up using it on anything. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Um, but I, I, Evan, I know you can get on board with a creature that's a four-one with with haste for four <laughs> mana. It's really hard to kill. That's I, right. I, I'm pretty sure you can get on board with, you know, Mrs. Tickles. Maybe <laughs> if, we can, if we can get there with that, is that acceptable? It's possible. A little Mrs. Tickles going on. Uh, sure. Very close to Giant Solid Fuge, one of my favorite cards, and that's uh, yeah. Captain Tickles, for those who don't know. Yeah. Uh, Falcon Wrath Riskrat itself, though, is just good old fashioned efficiency. It yeah. is going to kill you. It beats. It beats. This it is what it is. Enters the battlefield tapped, essentially. If you have other humans to chomp on, that's really sweet because then she can't die, uh, except for a minus X minus X effect. And yeah, Falcon Wrath Aristocrat was one of those cards that affected the metagame. You had to know what you were going to do after that card resolved. How do you get rid of it? Where is your timing window? You know, do you do it in a certain way that you try to kill it on their upkeep to make them sacrifice something? All these different sort of things 
pop up, and it and when a card is that good to influence a metagame that heavily, uh, it's definitely noteworthy. Like Falcon Round Thrust kind of is. Yeah. All right. So uh, because you know we can't have nice things, we're gonna move on here uh, to number five. And I actually have one. Yay! It's terrific. Wow. It's terrific. <laughs> um, so uh, when uh, when Ravnica first showed up. You know, and, and Lord knows if Ravnica's got anything, Ravnica's got cycles. Ravnica loves all the cycles, and they're super, super cool. And it's great because, and you mentioned this a little bit earlier, Ruben, that back in the day, there was a crazy deck that ran Dark Confidant, it ran Genshu of the Spires, it ran yep. Greater Gargadon, which was yep. totally worth it, by the way. I won a Mox with that deck, and I'll never forget because of part of the efficiency. Wow. No kidding. Because of Rakdos <laughs> Guildmage. Rakdos oh, yeah. Guildmage. Oh, is, I'm so glad Rakdos Guildmage is on your list. Yeah, it's two <laughs> Rakdos mana. Rakdos, you know, yeah. red or black, red or black. Uh, it is a 2-2 two, two uncommon zombie shaman. For a black and three generic mana, you discard a card, colon, target creature gets minus two, minus two until end of turn. And for a red and three generic mana, colon, you put a 2-1 red goblin creature token with haste onto the battlefield, exile it at the beginning of the next end step. So what you would often do is at the end of their turn, you would pay four and get a 2-1, and then on your turn, you would pay four and get a 2-1, and then swing for six, more, more or less kind of out of nowhere, essentially. So this guy was kind of an army in a can. So in, in addition to killing something, you could also make a 2-1 at the end of their turn, and then minus two, minus two something, or whatever. That type of versatility was incredible, and really gave that deck different angles of attack in ways that it just never had before. And uh, and I love all the guild mages, but obviously Rakdos guild mage has a, has a special place for that Mox Pearl I took home oh so long ago. Yeah. Wow, that's a nice one. Yeah, yeah. I, I I'm a huge fan of Rakdos Guildmage. I never took down. I never took home a Mox Pearl as a result of Rakdos Guildmage, but I was a big fan. Um, I had a play set of the Junior Super Series uh, Rakdos Guildmages for a little while, and they nice. were my pride and joy of that standard environment. Because um, whenever I'd play them, people were like, "I didn't even know that card had that promo." Um, and and I just love that card. I played uh, a lot of that Mardu deck against Nick Miller when mm. we were in college together. And Nick had a uh, like a blue white big mana control kind of deck. And Rakdos Guildmage was always the all star because my, my board would get swept and nothing would be left. And then I top deck a Rakdos Guildmage and get in there for a billion uh, a couple times and, and be able to finish the job. So uh, big fan of Rakdos Guildmage, and I'm glad it's on someone's list. It's so good. I love it. Oh. All right, so uh, Aaron, what is your number five? My number five is a common combat trick from Alara Reborn. Wow. Uh, that I don't think anybody would have ever imagined becoming the linchpin of a successful modern deck. Uh, my number five is Demonic Dread. Um, so Demonic Dread costs a colorless, a black, and a red. It's a sorcery. It is Cascade. It has a whole paragraph of reminder text. Uh, for those who don't know, it says whenever you play this spell, you can remove cards from the top of your library from the game until you remove a non-land card that costs less than Demonic Dread. You may then play that card without paying its mana cost, put the removed cards on the bottom in a random order. Uh, and then there's a sentence of target creature can't block this turn, which is surprisingly relevant um, sure. because sometimes, oh you know, after you have after you've cast Living End with Cascade, you sometimes just have the Cascaders hanging around. Um, and Violent Outburst is certainly a viable buff to help kind of buff your team. And this is also a way that a creature can't block this turn. And so you can use it to get your combo off the ground, to get Living End so you can bring everything back. And if you happen to draw a couple of these, it doesn't go to waste. There are They're going to try to block whatever you have. Um, and so this is a card I have cast plenty of before. It's always great when you, especially in the early game, when you like you cast it on something like a Noble Hierarch, and your opponent's like, mm -hmm. and then you're like, Cascade, and then you do the thing, and then they're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. um, and so the, the, the actual thing the card does doesn't really impress people. It's what the Cascade allows it right. to do that makes it a thing. Thomas Baxa did the art. Shout out to him. He signed all my copies uh, at GP Minneapolis a few years ago. The art is fantastic. You just see this big buff dude in armor scared out of his mind. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this card has uh, brought me a lot of happiness uh, in my day. You know, it turns out that free spells are broken. And yeah. <laughs> every time they've done free spells, they break something. And yeah. part of that breaking is now part of what modern is because, you know, that that's what they do. They print it, you know, 
at yeah. the time of this being in standard and I was I was at Pro Tour Honolulu and I was talking to an R&D member and I was just like why are you giving us free spells you know how ridiculous that can get and and the the R&D member said yeah but it's fun right and I'm like yeah <laughs> you know just like driving a, a supercharged car is amazing but that doesn't sure. make it fair for all the pintos over here like you know <laughs> It was it was it was really funny because you know the time is Bloodbred Elf and Bloodbred Elf was everything right. and blah blah blah. Man, just the the idea that you're getting something free. Yeah, this has a sentence on it. I'm glad that it's somewhat. You know, right. you need a creature to exist on the battlefield for you to be able to be able to play it. Otherwise, you're just doing broken things. Right. That was that's the one downside to Monarch Dread is it actually needs a target in order to cast it. Mm -hmm. um, that's why you sometimes see Forbidden Orchard in the uh, in the uh, Living Index. Hmm. Um, obviously, when Hypergenesis was legal, this was even more absurd. Um, I think Tamaharu Saito I think won a Grand Prix with Hypergenesis mm. uh, wow. with Demonic Dread and Violent Outburst um, as the uh, as the ways to cast those Living Ends uh, or the ways to cast those Hypergenesis. Um, yeah, just a, just a really good engine for a couple of different types of decks. Fantastic. So doing broken things is fun. Film at 11. Yes. All right. Uh, let's see here. So that's her number five, my number five. Ruben, what's your number five? Oh, come, oh come on. Look, man, we got to get him in before we get to the top. So <laughs> Got to you know. get there somehow, some way. All yeah. right. Well, we're going to move on here to number four. And guess what? Don't have one. Wow. It's sad. Ruben, what's your number four? Oh, man. Brutal. <laughs> so brutal. That's four of the five, though. We're Fair enough. We're done with the hires. Well, that's my last hire. So so maybe we can... Well, you got one more coming, and that's okay. Aaron, what's your number four? Speaking of broken things. Uh, so my friend Chris loves to point... <laughs> my friend Chris loves to point out the fact that it... <laughs> When we're ever when we're playing Commander, you can tell that I'm about to do something stupid because I just I just start laughing yeah. because I I mean I laugh to the point where I black out because broken things just make me feel so good <laughs> and my number four has made me feel amazing so <laughs> my number four is best when you could play it faster than it was ever intended to be played like on turn one uh, my number four is Sire of Insanity <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I cannot tell you how good it feels to cast this. Did you like reanimate and tomb reanimate in this on turn one and just watch your opponents just fall apart in front of you? I'm sorry. So anyway, so Sire of, I mean, I'm terrible. Um, so oh, Sire man. of Insanity is four colorless, a black and a red. Uh, it's a six, four demon. So six power, four toughness. At the beginning of each end step, each player discards their hand. So if you do this on turn one, like say you're playing Reanimator in Legacy, you go Dark Ritual, Entomb, Reanimate, pass the turn. <laughs> And your opponents, especially if you're on the play, they haven't they have not even played a land. So their hand just goes bye-bye. You don't have a hand, but you don't really care because you got a six four. What are they gonna do about that? And so this card has just brought me so much joy. Man. <laughs> and that's why it's my number four. <laughs> you know, wizards put a lot of turds in Dragon's Maze, but this was yeah. not one of them. This, oh my god. This was I think this was LSV's <laughs> preview. Uh they were like, yeah, this card's really good. And oh, yeah. it, it didn't, I think, see as much play uh as basically any card in Dragon's Maze, but uh Voice of Resurgence did. Uh right. but it did see a little glimmer here and there. And obviously when you're when you're getting on turn one, it's it's <laughs> insane. It's just so disgusting. Uh, oh man. It just it just yeah. feels like a hug from Jesus. Like and Jesus still, is wrapping his arms around you. Still an important uh, uh, option in Legacy Reanimator, uh, <laughs> particularly the Black Red Reanimator. Right? I think was this was yeah. a much more important piece of that puzzle yeah. uh, for that deck that came up much more recently. So uh, yeah, excellent choice. I also I do love the flavor text. Uh, its victims become mindless lunatics. <laughs> Conveniently, that's the first step in joining the cult of Rakdos. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That's lucky. Yeah, that's good. Good clean living right there. All right. And that was my number nine, by the way. Okay, for good, those, good. Those counting at home. I did have it on the list. Uh, it was it was a fantastic card. All right, so we're going to move on here to number three, where I, I have cards I can talk about now. Yay, I got good. stuff. I got all my top three I can actually talk about. It's really cool. Uh, so 
uh, back in the day, uh, they made the, obviously a lot of multicolor cards can come out of multicolor blocks, and Shadowmore was very good to Rakdos, as it were. Um, and uh, Rakdos, in particular, to be able to have flexibility, there was you know what what's the what's the opposite of Kitchen Finks, right? Like what are you, what are you supposed to do when you want to get value, just like they get value? Well, Murderous Redcap showed up. Yeah. yeah. As two Rakdos mana and two generic mana, so it's a four mana, two two uncommon goblin assassin. Uh, first of all, goblin assassin. When yep. murderous red cap comes, to, well, comes into play, uh, now enters the battlefield. It deals damage equal to its power to target creature or player, and it has persist, which means when this creature is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, if it had no minus one minus one counters on it, return it to play or to the battlefield rather under its owner's control with a minus one minus one counter on it. So you got your two coming in, and then it will block something, and then it would come back and deal a third damage, so it could kill a three three if it blocked a three three. Uh, it was used in many many type of loop effects. If you're able to not put minus one minus one counters on things, you're able to sacrifice right. something. Red cap is a killer. Red cap was a ba. Even if you couldn't just, you know, go off and kill someone in a heartbeat, just good old value, just great value on a 2 2 that kills a thing that comes back. You can do something like bounce it or some way get rid of a minus one minus one counter and suddenly it's still there. It's a guy that doesn't, yeah, that does so much. It it does so much in such a little tiny, weird looking dude. That's, yeah. a, that's a weird bird right there. That's yeah. a strange one. This was my number four. Cool. Um, I had it really high on my list. Again, tournament pedigree in all of those uh, uh, Malira pod kind of decks. Yeah. Uh, and then the core, the Malira cord uh, decks as well. It was a player in standard for a long time. Uh, I remember playing this card in standard and doing the nameless inversion trick, hmm. uh, which involves putting murderous red caps coming to play trigger on the stack and then nameless inversion in your own murderous red cap, which left it with its last known information of having five power. Um, and so you could six something because oh, you could man. kill your own red cap, have it come back, and then just knock off a six six immediately. Uh, and there were a bunch of six sixes for six in Lorwyn, so that was a that was a handy dandy little trick that I could do to take down a vigor or a guile or what have you. Um, murderous red cap is just absolute unmitigated value. Uh, it's almost always a necatrol um, being able to two for one, or sometimes even three for one. Uh, it's really good against control decks when it's even when it's not a necatrol because it's a it's a it basically is a two two haste that's really difficult to deal with. Um, it's uh, it's just a fabulously good card and can be run in a variety of different decks thanks to the hybrid mana. Um, and yeah, it's just a just one of my favorite cards. I remember the first time I lost to this card and somebody explained sort of the loop to me that, you know, the, you know, the birthing pod decks or the Malira decks, you know, they ideally just want to gain a million life. You know, they sort right. of want to loop the kitchen things, but they'll settle for that. Like that's sort of the plan B, if you will. And it's like, are you serious? And, you know, I always wonder, you know, what R&D thought of that like when they saw that this was a thing you know the idea that persist had been sort of you know twisted into this sort of abuse abusable mechanic you know i always wonder if they were just sitting there kind of pulling their hair out like that's not what we meant and so right. because you know when malira came out it gave people sort of free reign to do broken things and, and i love broken things as much as the next row but i always wonder what was going on behind the scenes like when the people who made persist saw that you know were they just like no 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 <laughs> Yeah. Oh or was God. there maybe somebody that was like, we're okay with this? You know, I always wonder. Yeah, that, the heyday of Murderous Redcap was certainly during the Birthing Pod era um, because, of course, Collected Company can't put a Murderous Redcap into play. Uh, so that, that version of the deck, uh, not nearly as. as uh, uh, but you can cord for it. Kind. You yeah. can cord for it, certainly. But it, it's much, much handier to be able to have a Murderous Redcap because you can chain through the Birthing Pod up to five and go oh, yeah. get your Revel Arc or your Kiki Jiki or what have you also. So uh, uh, that was that was certainly the Red Caps' heyday, but it's still just an excellent card. So, Ruben, do you have a number three? I do, <gasps> Evan. What? I, I, so, so, I mean, occasionally I will chime in with my opinions. <laughs> Every once in a while. I guess. I guess. Um, we're going to talk about a set I don't think we referenced yet, which is Dragons of Tarkir. Okay. Um, you know, there were some dragons in Dragons of Tarkir, mm -hmm. and many of them were Elder in variety, and mm -hmm. many of them were so Elder that they commanded legions. Wow. And uh, one such dragon was Kolagon, uh, and his command... Uh, 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 Kolagon was a lady. Sorry, her Ooh. command... <laughs> Get it right. Get it right. I apologize. At this point, I can only apologize. But... 
Irregardless and nevertheless, Kologon's command is my number three. So colorless, black, red, instant. Choose two. That's two. No. <laughs> Return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. Target player discards a card. Destroy target artifact and or Kologon's command deals two damage to target creature or player. We talked earlier with Rakdos Charm about how like each individual effect is like kind of bad. And Kologon's command is no different. An instant speed, raise dead, is not worth uh, three mana. Target player discards a card, is not worth three mana. Destroy target artifact, is not worth three mana. Like, these are all one mana effects, honestly. Right. Uh, it's same with deal two damage. Those are sort of shock and, you know, funeral charm and raise dead. But even though it costs three, uh, getting to do multiples of, of, of all these effects... Um, is, is super potent thanks to being able to have your card economy consolidated in your Kologon's command. You're able to take down uh, against Affinity, you're able to deal two damage to one creature and destroy another artifact. Against other aggro decks, you're able to uh, you know, rebuy another uh, a Tarmogoy for something along those lines and then destroy one of their creatures. Against control decks, you're able to rebuy a creature that they killed and make them lose one of the cards they're saving in their hand. There's just so many different things that you can do with Kologon's Command uh, and then rebuy with Kologon's Command if you have Snapcaster made from your deck, uh, which very often you do, especially in uh, Grixis Delver or Grixis Control in Modern. Um, it's just such a spectacularly good card for a very simple motif, really. Um, you know, I don't think that people would have picked Kologon's Command as being a modern all-star. Uh, they might have picked it as being very good, but it certainly has taken its place among the upper echelon of, of cards uh, and removal spells in modern. Oh, it is even a vital part of the... Uh, so Legacy has been... Uh, there's a deck in Legacy that has, has seen a lot of play recently called the Check Pile deck, sort of the yes. four-color control right. decks. And one of the cards that four-color makes room for is Kologon's Command. It is now a Legacy staple. And wow. uh, I have been on the wrong end of this card too many times. Like, ad nauseum, this card is our worst nightmare because yeah. you can destroy our mana rocks and make us discard a card, and then we're just sort of left naked and afraid. And so uh, this card is very, very scary. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm never happy to see this card. <laughs> I mean, it turns out that sometimes choosing you know what's better than choosing one well let's just get yeah. two awesome effects yeah you sort of yeah. powered it down to one mana effects as it were but uh, it's also very rare that wizards ever gives you instant speed discard because yes. there is a time window in which your opponent draws a card and you can play instance during their draw step and if they only have one card well it's gone so yeah. You know, at, during your draw step, when you're, you know, ha when you're a hellbent, if you will, uh, you know, discard whatever you just drew, and I'll get back my Snapcaster Mage because that feels good, doesn't it? Right. Yeah. Mm. yeah it's dumb. Um, yeah, it's is incredibly, incredibly powerful. Currently around twelve bucks. Who knows what uh, if it's going to be reprinted right now? It's only from Dragons of Tark here. Uh, yeah. it, it's it kind of killed me that like that Colagon herself was just not good enough. You know. Uh I just, I, you know, they kind of, they fair, pushed her, you know, but. Yeah. Dragon eh. Lord Kologon sees play in Vintage, and I played Kologon the Storm's Fury in a standard tournament to great effect. Are you going to make me do this? Uh-oh. What did I do? Are you, are you going to make me do this? Dragon Lord Kologon is my number three, bitches. Yeah. <gasps> <that's right. laughs> Have a seat. Oh. I'll handle this. Yeah. <laughs> So Dragon Lord Kologon, for those who are interested, is four colorless, a black and a red. She is a six-five legendary elder dragon. Work, um, <laughs> flying haste. And she says that other creatures you control have haste. Uh, there's also a nifty little paragraph that says, whenever an opponent casts a creature or planeswalker spell with the same name as a card in his or her graveyard, that player loses 10 life. Uh, she has made waves in Vintage, specifically with Dredge. Uh, nice. There is math to be done uh, in terms of when she becomes better than Flamekin Zealot, because Flamekin Zealot had been sort of our combo kill uh, win condition for a while. Um, the fact that you can feed her to Icarid is very relevant. Moat is a thing in Vintage, and she just sort of flies right over moat. Uh, I use her. I don't use Flame Kinzalad anymore. Uh, and she's worthy. You better put some spec on that name because that's, that's Dragon Lord Kologon. Yeah. Well, clearly, some of us know the vintage format and some of us don't. 
<laughs> you know, the most powerful yeah, format in all of play. Magic. Like, there was the black-red hasty yeah. decks, and you'd slam right. her, and then LOL. And... I, she saw a little, you know, like, for me, I, I, I felt like she just... It was like know, fringe play. It was fringe, sure. and I wanted her, like, you know, I think black-red, even today, has just had this weird sort of suffering of, like... It's just never that good, you know? It's mono black because it could splash a, bl- a red spell, you know? It's just, right. Rakdos in and of itself just needs something. I just don't know what it's it needs. It's been a little while since there was a black red <laughs> aggro deck. Mm-hmm. That wasn't just mono red, aggro. essentially. Right. It, wasn't, it wasn't mono red. Yeah. yeah. Aggro. So, ache. Aggro. Aggro. Egg rolls. But Dragonlord Colagon, in and of herself. Aggro is yeah. pretty terrific. So let's move on here to number two. Ruben, what's your number two? My number two is higher <laughs> on someone else's list. <clears throat> I don't know how I did it. I still have, by the way, a two, a seven, and a nine, and a five to fill in. <laughs> so all that... of my list is your top twos. I don't oh, know how this boy. is happening. Oh wow! Yeah. This is so good. This is this is quality trolling right here. That's, yeah, yep, that's I good. I was like, it's got to be coming at three. It's got. It, it had to be coming at four. No, it's got to be coming. At, where are all these cards? <laughs> crazy. Well, look. I will. I'll go ahead and explain what my number two is because it's dumb and it's busted and it's weird. How I'm good <laughs> this card is! It's ridiculous. Uh, luckily, they reprinted it a million times, just in case you don't have a copy. Uh, but from Alara Reborn, they had that cascade mechanic, and they had one of the best removal spells ever, ever printed in Batuminous Blast. So, <laughs> for red, a black, and three generic mana, it is an uncommon instant with cascade. As earlier, when you cast a spell, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a non-land card that costs less. You may cast it without paying its mana cost, and put the exile cards on the bottom in a random order. It also deals four damage to target creature. So, you could live the dream... And then Batumus Blast into Bloodbraid Elf into Blightning, or uh, what was the what was the three three for three? Ooh. Uh, the the creature. Uh, sprouting Thrynax. Sprouting Thrynax. Thank you very much. Um, wow. Mails from Pulse was another good three. Ooh. Oh yes. Hit. Uh, Kitchen Finks was a popular one as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, by the way, if you wanted to really live the dream, you had to start the chain with Enlisted Worm. Up oh at the my top god. With the white splash. Jeez. So 6543. I've done that a couple times. Uh, you know, no no brag, just saying. Yeah. But uh, but yeah. This was my number 9. Batuminous blast. Batuminous <laughs> blast. Uh, importance list as well. Import like right when Jund became Jund. This was standard Jund. Oh yes. Um, you know, the, the, the term Jund now is sort of like a catch-all phrase of like, it's sort of like a mid-rangey deck. It's like a mostly black, uh, green base that you can like, I guess we're playing red for lightning bolt. But back in the day, it was all three colors, super heavy requirement all the time. You had Broodmate Dragon, you had Sprouting Thrynax, and you had uh, uh, all the red creatures in the deck. Uh, like Bloodbraid Elf, uh, and then you had Batuminous Blast, which also required red, in addition to all the black removal oh, yeah. uh, that the deck was playing. Just such a insanely powerful card, being able to play it at instant speed. If your opponent played land five and passed, you knew exactly what was up. Um, just like, it was it was just an obscenely good card. It's it's good that it didn't deal any more damage than that. If it yes. dealt five, it would have killed Baneslayer Angel, which was a thing. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous enough because, you know, you, you play Batumas Blast and you spin that wheel. It's like, you, it's still a damn good spell. You know, some of the other ones are just like, turn creature, can't block, whatever. Like, no, no. Right. Something's dying and you're right. getting free spells out of it to boot. That, yeah, exactly. Oh, a lot of God. the cascade cards were like four mana gain four life. Or like, there was a 01 Flyer Regenerator. And it's just like, what are you? What is this? What are you like, doing? I cascade, yeah. Target creature can't block. Like, Ardent plea. What? Yeah, or <laughs> exalted. Just is an enchantment with exalted on it. Meanwhile, Batuminous Blast is just a card I would play without the cascade. I would just like draft this in my limited deck. Yeah, it's right? a good limited card. It's a reasonable card. So, uh, so yeah, Batuminous Blast is certainly well deserving of being in the top ten. Well, then you, you know, then you staple on a free spell, and turns out it'll run standard right. for a couple of years. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Turns out the Tomb's Blast, Bloodbraid Elf, and anything is just way too powerful for anyone to deal with. Stone anything. Yeah. Aaron. Free Bloodbraid. What is your number two? 
My number two was also a very important card in the Living Index. Uh, some famous art by RK Post. Uh, the ability to have a stone rain on a stick is really, really nifty uh, because, again, you could cheat this out with like Simeon Spirit Guide. You would sacrifice it and then you would bring it back with your with your Living End and then sacrifice it again and really leave your opponent stranded. You know, leave them with no way to deal with this board of creatures that you've brought back. It also sees play in the sideboard of the modern Jun decks. We've talked a lot about Jun tonight, um, and this is a really great way for those sort of decks to deal with the Tron decks, you know, because otherwise they don't really have a way to deal with the the Valakits and things like that, the, the Scape Ship Tron decks. Um, and number two is Fulminator Mage. Um, so Fulminator Mage is one and two hybrid mana, so either two red, two black, or some combination thereof. It's a 2-2 Elemental Shaman. Uh, it's from the, uh, from the Shadowmoor block. Mm -hmm. um, sacrifice Fulminator Mage, destroy target non-basic land. Uh, beautiful art, very Ashling, you know, that whole thing uh, from the set. Um, and this is great, you know, sometimes you either are feeling merciful and you don't have to destroy any lands. It's still a 2-2 body on a stick you can attack with, you know, or you can specifically go for certain kinds of land. Uh, this card was very expensive I'm at a time. I remember when I first built Living In, this was $40 a piece. Mm -hmm. um, it's fallen a little bit now to like 15 or 20 but it's still worth every penny. Um, I don't know any Jun decks that leave home without this card in the sideboard. Yep. It's great. Um, and it's staple in Living In for the longest time. And a lot of fond memories of this card. It's just, uh, yeah, and you'll never see anything like it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wizards Agreed. doesn't want, you know, uh, land destruction at three mana. They've they've no. said it many many times. They keep they keep saying it's the perfect three and a half mana card. Or, and not or, or just effect. not just at three mana, but at this versatility of three yeah. mana. Mm -hmm. This was my number seven, by the way. Nice. Uh, we're counting down. It seems we went there we nine go. Now we're at seven. All right, we're doing it. Fulminator Mage. You know, the, one of the downsides. It like if this was just this same casting cost, but not a creature, and said destroy target non basic land. You couldn't always play this on turn three. There would be situations where your opponent had three basic lands in play. This, you can just play it and start attacking for two or whatever. Um, it, it stands there, does the, the Sakura Tribelder trick where it prevents some damage and does its effect that you were going to do anyway. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's able to get recurred uh, uh, through various means, uh, th particularly things like Revel Arc in Modern, um, being able to bring these back, but uh, uh, and Colagon's Command, of course. Uh, Fulminator Mage, uh, a huge, important part of the metagame of modern because of decks like Tron, uh, decks that really depend heavily on their lands uh, or on specific lands in order to function correctly. Um, Fulminator Mage is a, is a, uh, has always been and will always be an important facet of modern, um, and, and it's well-deserving of a spot. It also just reminds me that it kind of sucks that RK Post doesn't do magic art that much anymore like yeah he he makes a he makes a main token and you'll see him at the events but they just yeah. don't really get him for new cards well, yeah well his body of work is massive so you'll see him at events but yeah it's, it's true they don't bring him back for much anymore yeah but he, I mean, he makes well luckily the, the events he goes to i think he makes really special he makes specific sure. play mats and tokens and stuff that you can only get oh, there absolutely. Uh, and his art is very much him like yes. you can you could obs you could obstruct the bottom part of a card and just no arcade. And identify arcade. Yeah, very yeah. signature style. Yeah, which is which I think is really great. Yeah. Um, yes. All right. Cool. So we're gonna move on here to number one, which Ruben actually has one. Wow. I do. That's incredible. What you got, you buddy? Go first. You might right, as well. well Let's we, do it. We talked about we talked about Batuminous Blast. <laughs> Batuminous Blast. In Batuminous Blast, <laughs> and the dream, if yes. you could pick would be to go into Blood Braid Elf. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you really, I mean, the real thing you wanted to hit off your Blood Braid Elf, you could hit a Kitchen Finks or a Sprouting Thrynax or whatever, but the thing you wanted to hit off your two minutes blast Blood Braid Elf was Blightning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Blightning is my number one overall uh, wow. card wow. For, uh, of all of, uh, all of Rakdos' history. And it's a common, and that just makes me so gosh darn happy. Uh, Lightning is a colorless, a black, and a red sorcery. Lightning deals three damage to target player. That player discards two cards. That's just good. That's just good living. Is That's what that right. is. That's right. This is. This is just a mind rot and a bolt. And that's what you do, and you just get it all. It's always a two for one. Yeah. Sometimes it's a three for one when you kill a planeswalker, mm -hmm. um, and and when you combine it with uh, with a bloodbraid elf, 
or you know anything that that, that uh, uh, you're able to play it in multiples. Uh, it just gets absurd so fast. Blightning is iconic in that it is the card you think of when you think of the original standard Jund. Right after Bloodbraid Elf, probably. Right after that is Blightning. Even before Batuminous Blast, before Broodmate Dragon, before Sprouting Thrynax, before any of that other stuff, I think Blightning is the card people think of when they think of that standard deck. The, the, imp, the, the beginning, the Ur-Jund, was Blightning. And it's got super iconic art, again, with the Thomas back, so I'm sure you can appreciate, Aaron. Um, it's got, uh, it's, it's just, it's just so, it just warms my, my cold heart to see a Blightning, and I just love it. The, the idea that you can essentially take a Mine Rot, which is, oh, yeah, it's all right, every once in a while, sometimes in Sealed, and yeah. you take a Bolt, which is obviously one of the best magic spells of all time, and then you say, but if you put them together, I mean, when, when I first saw this card, I was like, all right, it's, it's fine you know it's whatever sure. I, I see them yeah. doing their like little take spell a and spell b and you know they they have a very special hug and you know, all that stuff um but like for blightning to have literally just been one of the most important key cards so many times during that standard season it would just be like please just any spell but blightning any spell but blightning and it's always blightning you know it's like on webmd you know like my stomach hurts it's always cancer yeah. like it's always <laughs> cancer everything right. it's like my i got a weird like my hip hurt cancer it's always cancer <laughs> yep. blightning it's always blightning and you never yeah. want it and that 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 whole that other angle because planeswalkers were still brand spanking new they just printed some new ones in shards of alara right. that was a huge deal to not only be able to you know get cards out of their hand but also kill johnny vengeance or whatever just just right. out of nowhere yeah i mean it's not bolt it's lava spike so like it's i mean it's too really sure. again with like similar to Colagon's command it's like you wouldn't play these cards individually but once you staple them together it's so much value that you want to have that effect uh particularly because of how aggressive those original jund decks were you had so many ways to just close out the game super fast you had six you had eight power of flyers across two bodies for six mana and broodmate dragon you had haste creatures in in bloodbraid elf you had three threes for three and and uh and kitchen finks hard to kill three twos uh in addition to direct damage like bolt and blightning uh so th the fact that that was a much more aggressive version than the things we see in modern nowadays which are a little bit more grindy a little bit more uh, card advantage based um really lent itself to blightning um, but I, I just think that it's just so iconic. It, it just represented a year of Magic the Gathering, and that's really hard for a multicolored card to do, to be the most iconic card from an era. Uh, and Blightning was my number eight for those counting along at home. Okay. Aaron, what is your number one? Before I get into my number one, since we're talking about bulls, you know, like Ruben likes to bull, uh, can I say the B word? Am I allowed to say that on a family show? Fine, go for it. All right, so... So my number one is one of the, I can't do it like Ruben does, but one of the baddest butches of the multiverse. <laughs> I, I like what has happened. <laughs> um, when we talk about bad queens, when we talk about bad butches, we bad talk bitches. about bad bad bitches. Bitches, we talk about Emrakul, we talk about Merit Lage, but you gotta make room for one more. I relate to this person. I had the distinct honor of giving her a voice uh, in Jen Dukeshi's Voice for All mm -hmm. Magic Story podcast. Uh, she's Olivia Valderin. Um, what's not to love? Like this Eric Deschamp epic artwork, you see her just sort of floating above the crowd. Uh, the infamous, the skirt pulled up and that whole nonsense. Uh, mm -hmm. She literally takes over games by herself. If you let someone with Olivia untap with her, we're going to run away with the game, and it's glorious. Uh, so Olivia is two colorless, a black and a red. She's a legendary vampire. Three, three flyer. <clears throat> one and a red, semicolon. She deals one damage to another target creature. That creature becomes a vampire in addition to its other types, and you can put a plus one, plus one counter on Olivia. Uh, you can then spend three and two black, uh, to gain control of target vampire for as long as you control Olivia Baldarin. So she basically just turns into a cannon of sorts where it's like, you're a vampire, I get bigger, I'm gonna come back for you later. And the next turn happens and she takes things. And so she just runs away with the game so quickly. She was in a format with things like Lingering Souls where she would just pew, 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 and just get really out of control. 
Uh, you sometimes see her in the sideboard of Modern Jund again, because again, this is a format where you got little things to kill. You know, you've got the birthing pod decks or the company decks with little mana dorks that she can just pick away, you know, little infect creatures, lingering souls, affinity, uh, the little things that they like to have. Um, she just is just a home run. The art, the flavor, the idea of her feeding, which is the the one in a red, and then, you know, the, the vampire aspect of taking control of you. Uh, this is a character that we continue to see. She came back in Shadows of her Innistrad. Uh, she recently saw playing one of the Commander 2017 decks with the New Blood. Uh, Sprinkle, Christine Sprinkle, immortalized her in cosplay. I love everything about this card, and so there was there was no no question that she was going to be my number one. Olivia uh, is is uh, is incredible by herself, um, yeah. and I literally had just totally forgotten about that second ability. <laughs> like yeah. I was like, wait, she does something else too. Oh yeah, she's got this weird control magic <clears throat> thing. Like Turns just out by she's the way, also Memnarch in addition to being <laughs> Mastercore. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, an insane value for the thing. There, there was the whole "What is she doing? How do you pull a skirt that way? Did they? Well, put, did he put a knee and forget? I mean, I'm not a fashion scientist. All right, I'll, 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 I'll let the the artists decide. <laughs> I think, I think there was some real sadness when I feel like they tried to push Olivia mobilized for war. First yeah. of all, that's an amazing card name. Uh, but it, it just didn't happen. It the just, art is hideous. Like, it just didn't happen. It did, yeah, vampires just didn't happen during that set. And need, yeah. honestly, need, they didn't happen during Dark Ascension either. Yeah. But Olivia didn't need no man. She, she did on her own. <laughs> she, you know, she just come down on the battlefield by her own damn self and take over everything. <laughs> this was my number two, by the way. Nice. Um, Highest uh, highest creature on my list. Um, you know, when you talk about the resurgence of Jund, the second coming of Standard Jund, the Reduke era of Jund, um, that was Olivia Vildaren. That was the card. You, I mean, you had scavenging ooze and you had a lot of good support structure around it, but it was Olivia. That was the card um, that made everything. That it held the room together. You know, the unholy love child of Masticor, Memnarch, and Anne Rice novels coming together. To, uh, to create just an obscenely powerful and flavorful vampire. Oh, yeah. Um, she bites you, and then she'll come and take you later. The like, art, though, like, I'm just looking at it now, and I'm just like, damn it. Like, oh, I can't stand it. So uh, my number one, and through the powers of deduction, is Ruben's number five. Uh, what I like to what I like to sim simply say to myself is a you know for, for these being my favorite cards, I, I often lean on the iconic side of things. I like I like to lean on what is the classic thing that this combination does that is very much this combination, right? What's the, what's the flavor? What's the guilt? Whatever. And way back when they did the first multicolor block, and everybody like lost their minds about how cool it was an invasion block. Uh, Later in Plane Shift, they made a common that redefined removal spells because at the time there was terror, you know, and there were plenty of direct damage things, whatever, but nothing just said, just, just kill it, just kill it dead. It's going to die. It's going to die forever. And Terminate did that. Terminate yeah. is a black and a red common instant from Plane Shift. Uh, and it says destroy target creature. It can't be regenerated because regeneration isn't a thing anymore. Uh, very well needed to be, it loses regeneration and then destroy it or loses uh, indestructibility rather. Indestructible. Right, because right. that's kind of the new regeneration. It'll, it grocks a little bit better. Uh, but Terminate at the time was just like, oh my God, it's an instant. It, it's just it's just two mana. This is like this is like incredibly efficient. Oh my God. Like no one had ever seen anything that efficient before. That's incredible. So, <laughs> you know, so, so it's really cool to be able to break those, sort of break that, uh, that weird, that weird um, ceiling of how good should a removal spell be? Well, for too many, just killing everything. Uh, and yeah. that's pretty great. They made a ton of promos with this card. They've reprinted it a lot um, because yeah. it does what you want the Rakdos pair to right. do, which is it's stop simple. something from existing. It's simple. It's perfect. Just yeah. leave it. It's fine. It's, it's good the way it is. And that is terminate, and uh, and and you can't argue with the simplicity of of what that did. And when this was printed, it was a revelation, because this was not a, the sentence destroy target creature had not really been printed hmm. as such. You had you always had these other you know dark banishing terror kind of garbage where you were just like had all these restrictions on yourself. Mm -hmm. And this one doesn't. This one doesn't care what color. This one doesn't doesn't discriminate. You're all dead. And uh, and it's it's just a fabulous card. I mean, it, it's, it's, it was reprinted in Commander 2017. You know, like literally this year, they were like, hey, this card's still relevant and still makes it's sense. 
could absolutely have found its way into Iconic Masters. I think that when you say the word Iconic, this is an Iconic card. Oh, yeah. there's um, so much wrong with Iconic Masters. Look, man, <laughs> so I'm much. Saying, we're trying to keep it under two hours. Though. All right, all right, right. fine, <laughs> fine. You know, uh, well, it'll, it'll go down in history, and, and we'll get to talk about it later. All right, so that was our top ten favorite Rakdos cards. You'll see them on the screen now for you to review. Uh, but we want to hear from you about what card we didn't talk about. And we'll select our favorite to win a $50 gift certificate from CoolStuffInc.com. But before we go, I want to thank my co-hosts. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you, Evan. Yeah, buddy. And we're going to move on here to our final slide. So I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, our co-sponsor, CardHoarder.com, my co-hosts, Aaron Campbell and Ruben Bressler, you guys for watching or listening, and hope you support us at Patreon.com slash Magic Mics. Visit our website at MagicMicsPodcast.com that exists thanks to our Patreon supporters, or follow, like, tweet, favorite, share, subscribe, do everything social that tells people we exist. Catch us online at Twitch.tv slash Magic Mics, on Twitter at Magic Mics Cast, on Reddit at Reddit.com slash R slash Magic Mics, on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Magic Mics. Talk to us privately at Magic Mics Podcast at gmail.com. Follow the audio-only podcast at Magic Mics Podcast on Libsyn.com, or find us on iTunes or join us here next week for another top 10 episode of Magic Mike's. Good night, everybody. <laughs>